Well, I want to come to back to my text in Isaiah 43. Remember, the text for the year, of course, is 1819, but we're looking really at this question of why we should believe this great promise made to us. God has given us a great promise in Isaiah 43, verse 18 and 19. He would do a new thing. He would make it so great that he says that the, you won't even remember. And in fact, it's a command not to remember, to look ahead, not to the past. In 2020, we must do that. We've got to look to a new thing that God has says in his word he will do. I will do it. When you look out at the present scene in Britain today, you might say, well, I hope he does. You know, we will be back here next year if all we've got is I hope he does. It will not happen as far as I understand my Bible if all we have is I hope he does. We've got to believe that he will, not hope that he will. Faith is absolutely essential according to the Scriptures. In fact, the writer to the Hebrew says, without faith, It's just impossible. It's not impossible with God, but God only works according to faith. It's kind of a principle. Even Jesus, it said, could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief. He wasn't limited in his power. He just refused to work where there was unbelief. God doesn't work. So there are reasons why God doesn't work, and that is one of them. Now, there may be many reasons. You can just look at the empty seats in our churches, look at the less than 1% in Britain that are really attending a place of worship and are actually believers. How many of the percent? How many are believers today in our country of 60-odd million people? It's a desperate situation. Of course it is. It's a serious time. But then when we look at it like that and we see it like that, we could become perplexed. And yet God makes these great promises and says that what he's able to do and what he can do. We might look at it and say, ah, but will he do it? Is he going to do it? And when you look at the situation, it's quite easy to say, well, it's been like this for a long time. Is it going to change? I'm not a prophet of doom. There are prophets of doom in the church that say, God isn't going to do it. We have no reason to expect him to do it. He's given this nation over. He's washed his hands. We're just to expect now the return of Christ and maybe a few will be saved. This is the great fall in a way, don't you know it? This is what we should expect. Now, I believe there are reasons why God doesn't work and we should examine them. We should say, Lord, is it me? Is it my sin? That could be a reason. Lord, is it my unbelief that I haven't got? Is there a lack of faith? Lord, is it prayer? Is there a lack of believing prayer? There are lots of reasons you can come and apply. Yes, it can be God's purpose and will. But having gone through the list and said, well, make sure that's right, and that's right, and that's right. If still we don't see it, well, then God's will be done. But we mustn't ignore the others. And we mustn't go the other way and say, well, the reason why we haven't, it's all our fault, kind of beating ourselves up. If revival comes, you know, to Blackpool, even to this church, if any of these things that are promised here should happen in our lifetime and we see them, guess what? It won't be because we pray. It will be by the grace of God. It will be to God be the glory. We didn't deserve it. Not one person in Blackpool deserves to be saved. Not one. It will always be an act of God's sovereign grace. And yet he has called us to believe And he's called us to participate with him and to call upon him. And we've seen recently that he's made these great promises. He will do this. He will make a way where the deed seems to be no way. He'll even make a river in the desert. Remember we saw this morning where he says, fear not, fear not. I reminded you again, this is all the way through the Bible. I will do it. Now, the question we ask again and we challenge in ourselves is, will we believe him? In this passage in Isaiah 43, we said God gives us reasons why we should believe him. That's all we're looking at, reasons why. Now, the text is Isaiah 43, verse 1. But now, says the Lord, listen to this, fear not, the second part of the verse, 
For I have redeemed you. That's what we saw this morning. I have redeemed you. And then tonight, I have called you by your name. You are mine. I have redeemed you. That's the first reason. He says you are mine because I bought you. I purchased you. I, 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 the word redeem means to buy out or buy back. Christ is our redeemer, we saw. He paid the price for our sins. He, he has paid for us. We are bought and paid for by the precious blood of Christ. He has removed the penalty of sin and the punishment of sin. He's taken the pay, the punishment. He's paid the price. It's a covenant of redemption. Ephesians 1. In Him we have redemption through His blood. He's paid. He's paid till the Father said, Enough! It's enough. There's nothing more to pay. This, we saw at the communion table, is the new covenant in my blood. Now, the point the Bible makes is this, that this is a covenant promise, a covenant that God has made and entered into, and it's a certain guarantee with it. How guaranteed is it? 100%, 100% certain. Now we come to the next reason that he gives us, another great reason, I would suggest an even greater reason to believe God than the first one, and that was amazing. What is it? Well, I have, this is the message tonight, I have called you. I have called you. You see, when he says fear not, he means believe me, trust me. I have redeemed you. I have called you. Now, it's an even greater certainty of God's promises to us. I have called you. What does it mean? Well, to put it in another way, again, I said it this morning, although the two words are different, he's saying, I have saved you. That's what he's saying, simply, I've saved you. It's a reference to our salvation. Those ladies who were there on Friday, remember the ladies' Bible said I did the conversion of the Jews, and I said, how does God speak about the conversion? I have called you, he keeps on saying. I will call you. It, it, it was this call to salvation. He's referring to their salvation, and it's the same here. I have called you, I have saved you. Now, the Bible's very clear on this. Salvation is a work that only God can do. It's a work of the Lord. This call, this calling, is linked to what we call the new birth. In John 3, Jesus said, you must be born again. It's the same thing, really, in a sense. Call it regeneration, the new birth. There's no salvation without it. You must be born again. Now, if you look at the index of our hymn book, you'll see that there are various classifications of hymns. And one classification is invitation and response. Invitation to the gospel and then response to the gospel. Another classification is divine calling and new birth. You see how they go together? The divine calling and the new birth. Now, why are they classified in that? Well, they're spiritual truths. And the hymns are about those truths. Now, the word here is a reference to this divine calling, this new birth. Now, we must also see the other kind of calling, the invitation and the response as well. So, in the Bible, there are, if you like, one call, but yet there are two calls. Now, theologians call them external and internal, to classify them, to help us understand what the Bible means. So you have what we call a, an external call, and then we have an internal call, obviously that which is inside, something deeper. Now what are they? Well, let's examine it. The external call is simply that section of the hymn book that says, you can look it up, invitation and response. That's all it is. God invites sinners to respond to the gospel. He invites all sinners. It's the worldwide invitation to everyone. There's no one not invited. He invites all sinners to respond to the gospel, to accept salvation by faith. The gospel of Jesus Christ, to accept salvation offered to them in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, you have that everywhere in the gospels. Our Lord taught parables. Do you remember the parable of the Great Supper? 
the parable of the wedding banquet, everything's ready, now go out and invite them to come. All are invited in that sense. It's an invitation. It's a serious invitation. When we preach the gospel, it's always an invitation to respond. It's a serious call. How serious is it? Well, repent and believe the gospel. Jesus says, unless you repent and believe the gospel, you will perish. He told us that in Mark 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Tell it to everyone. Preach the gospel to every creature, every single person. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. And that word condemns mean condemned forever. It's an eternal condemnation. So it's a very serious invitation. You know, we mustn't ever present the gospel as if it's a kind of take it or leave it. We mustn't present the gospel as if it's you go away and, and you kind of think it over and make your mind up. Not at all. No, now the call is now. Every time we do Christianity Explored, we always end it with as if the person is not coming back next week for next week's lesson. They might get killed in a car crash. They might not be at the next lesson ever again. We've had people do the course and never complete it. Do a three and then they don't come back. Everyone must complete in a sense, with this urgency to respond. We always do it that way because there is this seriousness. It's a very serious thing to hear the gospel. Now, Paul argues this in Romans chapter 10. He says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But he says, how are they going to hear if nobody tells them? And how will they hear without a preacher? Now, blessed are those feet that preach the gospel of peace. They must hear. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And if we are under any obligation, it is to make that gospel known. We're responsible. That's the church's work, the external call. Did you know you're responsible for God's external call? How's God going to speak to the people in Blackpool? How's he going to do it? Ah, oh, he can speak to anyone, you say. Well, wait a minute. He commands us to go. And everyone must hear the external invitation. On the day of Christ, the Lord will say to every single congregation, every single area, not just nations now, not just counties, not just towns, but even congregations. Now, what did you do in the invitation for these people who were stood here condemned? Did they tell you? Did you hear? I didn't even know anything they'll say. I never heard. Friends, we'll not be condemned to hell, but there will be a, an account at the judgment seat of Christ. How will they hear? How will they believe unless they hear? And how will they hear unless somebody tells them? It's a fundamental, serious call. But that's the invitation. But then there's the internal call. That's God's work. That's His work. What is this? Well, I put it like this. It's exactly the same as the external call. Now, this makes me realize how important it is, to, the external call. How important it is to get the gospel out. You know, churches are praying for people to be saved, but nobody's hearing. Nobody's hearing the gospel. It doesn't work that way. Our God can save without us. Have you, have you got that theology? God can save without you? Because salvation is of the Lord, because it's an internal call, but the internal is the external. It's exactly the same. What do you mean? Well, the only difference between the internal and the external is this. It's made effective. God takes our foolish sharing of the gospel and makes it effective by the powerful work of the Holy Spirit. That's how it is. The only difference. It's an effectual call. It's a great truth in the Bible. And the great truth that God is telling us in this verse is this, that it never fails. That it cannot fail. Why not? Why does it not fail? Because it is the power of God. It's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. In other words, the Bible tells us the one who receives this call will be saved. 
You see it? They will be saved. Not might be or could be. They will be saved. Now the language of the Bible on this very calling is very simple and very powerful and very clear. A Christian is somebody who's received this internal call. Has received this effective call. So God comes to us and says, he reminds us, he says, look, he says, do not fear, be believing. I have redeemed you. Yes, I have called you. And look at the words, by your name. But look at the first bit, I have called you. Now let's give you some examples on this. If you turn with me to the epistle to the Romans, uh, we had at Romans 8, we will look at that tonight, but go to Romans chapter 1. It's page 594 in the Pew Bible, Romans 1 verse 1. It's interesting that all Paul's epistles begin this way. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. There's the same word. Called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Oh, well, that's Paul. He's called to be an apostle. Listen. Which he promised before through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Oh, listen. Declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead. He's declaring the gospel, isn't he? To whom we have received grace and apostleship, and obedience Obedience to the faith among all the nations for his name's sake. Look at verse 6. Among whom you also, that's the church in Rome and every believer as well, you also are the called of Jesus Christ. That's how he describes Christians, the called of Jesus Christ. Verse 7. To all who are in Rome. Look at the words he uses. Beloved of God. It's a very important word. Beloved of God, beloved of God, called to be saints, called to be saints. Now turn with me to the epistle to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians in chapter 1, it's page 6 or 2 in the Pew Bible, it's the same teaching, it's the same doctrine, it's the same calling. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, well let's look at verse 2 to the church of God which is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. There it is again, called to be saints, sanctified, beloved, separated, called to be saints. Look at verse 9. God is faithful whom you were, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Called into a relationship with Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called. Now look at this great chapter unfold. If you go to verse 23, do you remember this great statement? But we preach Christ crucified. Oh, what a statement. That's the gospel, Christ crucified. In chapter 2 he says, I don't want to know anything except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the gospel. We preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. Okay, but to those who are called, how about that? To our, those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. It's a marvelous truth it is. What a great statement that is. Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. I mean, the very argument of this thing he says, for you see your call in verse 26, brethren, not many mighty, not many noble are called. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Not everyone receives this call. But he's called you. God has done this to you. He argues the same thing in the second chapter. Called to be saints, called into the fellowship of Jesus Christ. He says, we preach the gospel. We preach Christ crucified. But most people reject it. Not everyone believes it. They're given an invitation, but they fail to respond to the invitation. It's as he argues in 1 Corinthians, it's a stumbling block to some. It's foolishness to others. But to those who are called, it's the power of God. Do you see it? Do you see your calling, he says? Do you see your calling now? God says to you as a Christian, 
I have called you. I have called you. It's so personal. It's so individual. It's so significant to get hold of this. You want to be thinking now as if you're the only person not in this building, not in Blackpool, in the whole country, in the world. God is looking at you tonight and says, I have called you. It's a staggering truth. He says the same thing I said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The argument is it's the power of God. He says the same thing in Ephesians in chapter 2. He says, you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. You were afar off, have been drawn near. It's a call. It's the power of God. He called you. And the argument is always the same. You see it, says God. It's my power that's done this. It's the power of God. Now, do you remember the language he uses all the way through the Bible? He says, when he says, I, I want you to believe that I've called you, I want you to understand what it means. Paul in Ephesians says, I pray that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened. You would know the greatness, the exceeding greatness of his power towards you in this call. That you would understand that, that he has called you. You would grasp the immensity of it. I pray that he would show you what it means. It's interesting, he prays that you might, in the second prayer in chapter 3, that you might be filled with the fullness of God to know the love of God. But here he wants us to know the power of God. I want you to know how great is God's power towards you who believe. Let me give you an example. Do you remember Lazarus? Do you remember him? What happened to him? Of course, he died. Our Lord allowed him to die. If he had been here, his sister Martha and Mary said, our brother would not have died, but our Lord allowed him to die. Of course, our Lord could have healed him. He didn't. He didn't plan to heal Lazarus. He planned to raise him from the dead. And so he goes and said, this sickness is not unto death, uh, but the Son of God will be glorified. But he's already dead. He's been dead a while. The stench. Roll the stone away. Lord, please, the smell. No way. Do it. Now what did he say? You remember it? Immortal words. Lazarus, come forth. And it's been rightly said, and truly, truly said, if he hadn't have said, Lazarus, come forth, then they would have all come forth. Such is the power and the authority of God. Jesus said it. One day he'll do it. One day he said, not just the spiritual, but in the natural, all who are in the graves will hear my voice and come forth. They'll come to judgment. But he spoke about it in terms of salvation. Those who are spiritually dead will come forth. It's the same power that Jesus commanded over death and said, you who are dead, you who cannot come forth, who cannot come to me. You remember our Lord said that, no man can come to me unless the Father draws him. It's a calling. It's, it's the power of God. And so he says, I have called you, and he uses this word, beautiful word, I have called you by your name. You see it? By your name. It's personal. Oh, he said, Lazarus, come forth. I have called you, says God, by your name. It's wonderful. So when you meditate on this tonight, you see, you can say, do you know, God called me. According to the Bible, he called me. He spoke life into my dead soul. He did. He came along my way into my, to my grave, into my spiritual death, and he spoke words of life. And he commanded the dead to live. He commanded light to shine into the darkness. Oh, look at the conversions of the Bible and you'll see it everywhere. And sometimes you just even see it just in the very words where he called them by name. How was Abraham converted? Well, listen. Abraham. Abraham. Do you remember it? Oh, do you remember little boy Samuel? Samuel. Samuel. 
Uh, what do you want, Eli? I, I haven't called you. But he, you asked me. No, three. No, no. He says, go back. He recognized it was the Lord that was calling him. He didn't know the Lord. He wasn't yet the Lord. He wasn't yet converted. But he received this call. You remember another man called Levi in the Bible, or, or otherwise called Matthew, sitting at the tax booth? What did Jesus say? Matthew. Follow me. An effectual, powerful call. It says he left everything and he rose up and followed Christ. He came to those apostles, those fishermen, and said, follow me. He didn't give them a can of, would you like to follow me or would it be nice? God is never asking. He's commanding, but with authority and power. The greatest one is the apostle Paul, who was otherwise called Saul. I have called you by your name. He said, Saul, Saul. Saul, Saul from heaven. A voice spoke to me, called me by my name. I said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus. It's Jesus who calls. The hymn writer says, have you heard the voice of Jesus softly pleading with your heart? Have you felt his presence glorious as he calls your soul apart? Oh, he has called me. You should never get over this. He has called me. You should be able to say tonight, we are the call of Jesus Christ. Now, in the general call, the argument is this. Many don't respond to that. Many hear it, but they don't respond. But in the internal call, which is the same, made effective and powerful, this call is the call in our text. Listen, everyone who receives it responds. Everyone. It never, ever fails. It cannot fail. The one who receives this call will be saved. Not may be saved, could be saved. They will be saved. They will be saved. So when God says, I have called you, he's saying, I have done it. I have saved you. I have done it by my power, by my omnipotent power. Oh, the language of God is very clear. It's a beautiful verse, this. Oh, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you. You see the emphasis? I have done it. God has done it. I have done it. And I've called you by your name, and you are mine. Why did you receive this call? Why did I receive this call? Well, I always think of it like this. Why me and not others? Have you ever thought that? If you haven't, you should have by now. No one who is a real Christian ever thinks they deserve to be a Christian. Who could ever think they earned this or deserve it? No, but why? Why me? Have you ever considered how many billions of people are on this planet tonight? And yet you have received the call. Why me? 68 million in this country. I can't get my head around that. And there's just a remnant of few now. It's not a great number compared to the millions that haven't received the call. Oh, they need to receive that general call. That's our responsibility as a church. How we've got to get the gospel out. Jesus put it like this in Matthew 22, 14. He said, many are called, but few are chosen. Few respond, few are chosen. Listen to the the words of the Apostle Paul. Look at the way he speaks in the epistle to the, well, all the epistles he begins like this, but I'm thinking of what he says in the epistle to the Galatians. Listen to how he puts it in Galatians 1 and verse 15. He says, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. I read in the prayer meeting tonight, Jeremiah, do you remember Jeremiah in chapter 3? Oh, he says, I knew you before you were born. I knew you when you were, before you were in your mother's womb. I knew you. I separated you. I called you. 
It was all part of an eternal plan. And in Jeremiah 31, he says, The Lord appeared of old to me and said these words, incredible words, I have loved you. Now notice the words, love, not I love you. I have loved you. This is key. Not I love you, I have loved you. It's in the past tense. When did he love me? I have loved you. It's mind-blowing. With an everlasting love. With an eternal love. I loved you in eternity. I loved you then. I knew you then. And I loved you then. You weren't even made. I hadn't even created the world, let alone created you. And that point in history, you hadn't come forth. I hadn't brought you forth. Even before you were formed in your mother's womb, I loved you. It's mind-blowing. Oh, it's awesome. It's, it's beyond the preacher's ability to communicate. He separated me, says Paul, from my mother's womb before the world began. And he called me through his grace. And there's your answer. Paul gives it up in Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. Why me? Grace. Grace means undeserved favor. Now listen to the great argument. We had it in the reading tonight. I want to turn to Romans chapter 8. Look at the great logic of the Apostle Paul. Because in this morning's message we said that Paul argued like this. If God so loved us that he spared not his own son but delivered him up, how shall he not therefore freely give us all things? He's given us that. Well, he now makes a different point, but it's an even better one, an even greater one, and that is awesome. Let me, let me, let me go further back, not to verse 32. That was a great argument. Oh, but listen to verse 28. He says, We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are, again, the word, the call. Not called, the call. Can you see? It's a classification. He's not saying uh, uh, to those who were called, were called by God. He's saying you are the called. It's what you are. It's your identity. I'm a Christian. Well, here's a biblical definition of a Christian. A saint, yes. But this one, the called. Who are these people? They are the called. Do you know what the word church means? In the Greek, ekklesia, church. What does it mean? The called one. Those who are called out of the world. You are the called of Jesus Christ. What an amazing truth it is. He says, oh, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Does everything work together for good for everybody else? No, it doesn't. Only to those who are the called. Did you know that God is orchestrating the whole universe the whole world for his church. He would move heaven and earth for his church. He works everything for his church. The call. He works all things, everything together for good. It's all working for our benefit. To those who are the call, it's a staggering truth. But he hasn't finished because he says, according to his purpose. Now, what about that for a statement? Now, then you get to verse 29, and it just blows your mind, because Paul says something that's, it's not audacious, it's not extravagant, it's unbelievable. Because Paul says, like God says in his word, because this is God's word, it's not Paul who said it, it's the Spirit of God in him, it's, it's inspired scripture, it's God's word, and God is saying it. And God is saying the same thing that he says in Isaiah. He's saying, I, I have called you, or I have loved you with an everlasting love. How does he put it like this? For whom he foreknew, foreknowledge is not as some preachers say that God knew who would and who wouldn't be saved. That's what we call Arminianism. Arminianism is not something that, the, they don't not believe in election, their just understanding of election is different. They say, it's not that God chose people, 
No, he didn't do that. What he did is he knows the beginning and the end, and he saw who would and who wouldn't respond to the gospel. And in that sense, he could write a book, and there's the knowledge, the foreknowledge of God. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what's coming tomorrow. He knows who's going to respond. What's wrong with that teaching? Although it's an element, always heresy has truth in it, the great truth. God does know what's coming. He knows the beginning and the end. But why is it false? I'll tell you why it's false. I've said it already. Because we cannot respond. We're dead. We're dead. Nobody can respond to the gospel unless God draws him and calls him powerfully. Nobody can. You can't respond if you're dead. You can't make yourself come from death to life. You can't. So why, why does some respond? Because he foreknew them. The word foreknew is a deeper acquaintance with. He knew them. He loved them. For whom he foreknew, then we have the word predestined. God predestined. The word predestined is a very clear word. Predestined. It's something determined by God from eternity. A plan. Oh, listen. To be conformed to the image of his Son. That was the great plan of salvation. They would be glorified. They would be glorified. Conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That means he'll be the first to be glorified. Jesus has risen from the dead. He's glorified. He's the first of a new human race. But he's going to make a, a, a whole company of people who are going to be glorified. Now look at the next verse. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Well, listen to this. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. And then he asked the question, what shall we say to this? What can we say to this? And sometimes we miss the immensity of verse 30, because verse 30 is much greater than verse 28 and 29. 28 is marvelous, 29 is glorious, 30 is unbelievable. Because he's speaking in the past tense. And so what is he saying? He's saying, well, you know what? God predestined. He did it in the past. Eternity past. He predestined. And listen to him now. Whom he predestined, now we're in time now, in history, he called. And whom he called, he justified. He saved and justified. Now we're going to the future. And whom he justified, he glorified. And every single one of those statements is put in the past tense. This was written 2,000 years ago, Fred. Before you were born. Yet God declares our salvation as a completed act of redemption. It's done as far as God is concerned. Can you see what he's saying? God spoke about it in such a way that he, he, he not only says... I, I, I want to tell you that if he gave us your own son, how will he not freely give us all things? But he wants to tell us this certainty of the promise that not only does all things work together for good to them that love God, but they are those who are the called of Jesus Christ, the called. And they are linked together. Whom he, whom he predestined, he called. Whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. Notice he doesn't mention sanctified. The Christian life doesn't mention that. Go straight to heaven, straight to the end, straight to glory. And they're all joined together as an unbroken chain. And it began in eternity past, and it doesn't end because it goes on into eternity future. And Paul puts it like this in Romans 8, there's nothing can break that chain, nothing. And the great point of Romans chapter 8 and verse 30, which is a glorious truth, it, he, the great point he's making is this. It is so glorious, he says, it is certain. How certain is your salvation? How certain is it? He says, well, he predestined you, he called you, he justified you, and he glorified you. But I'm not yet glorified. God says it's already done. Or as he's concerned, 
It's not yet done. I'm not in heaven. I haven't got a glorified body yet. But as far as heaven is concerned, as far as God is concerned, it's done now. It's guaranteed. That's the point. What can separate me from this? What can stop me from reaching this? He tells you there isn't anything. If God has justified you, who can condemn you? He says all things are working together for this purpose and this unbroken chain cannot be broken and in the end you will be glorified because he's declared it. He doesn't say you might be glorified or you will be glorified. He doesn't say whom he saved in this world, whom he justified, he's, he's going to glorify them. He doesn't say that. He says he already did it already done he glorified it's in the past tense that's what makes romans 8 30 so staggeringly amazing it's in the past tense if you get hold of the argument you say nothing can stop it well what has that got to do with this truth well that's oh this is the argument of romans 8 that follows to the end of the chapter. It's the argument that he, he begins to add on and add on these questions and begins to show you that there is neither height nor depth nor breadth nor life nor death nor angels nor principalities, death, nothing. Not the devil himself, not hell, not heaven. Nothing can separate me. Nothing. And so can you see the point now as you look at Isaiah 43? What's the point you're making? This is the point. Fear not. I have called you. I have called you. To use the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, if God be for us, what can be against us? What can stop it? That's the point. What can stop this? And the answer comes back in the Bible, nothing. Nothing can. Friends, I asked that question again as I asked it this morning. What is really a matter with the Christian church at this time? I suggest to you, according to my Bible and your Bible, God will not fail us. He will not fail us. Those two old ladies in the Lewis Revival, they prayed on the covenant promises of God to pour water on the thirsty floods on the dry ground. They said like this, they said, Lord, you said you would make a way, let's paraphrase it, you said you would pour rivers of living water. You said if we call, you would answer. You said you'd do it. And we've been praying and you haven't done it. That's how they prayed. They did it reverently, but that's how they prayed. They held on to God's covenant and they said, Lord, it says here you do it and you must do it because you said, call and I will do it. And you've not done it. I love what they said to the minister when he came. And he wasn't believing. He didn't have their faith. They had amazing faith, those two women. Incredible faith. They said these words, memorable words. Did he fail us? Never. Never. All the promises of God are there for us to be believed. To be believed. God will not fail us. His promises will not fail. They are, says Paul, yes and amen. And they were never forfeited yet, says the hymn writer. Never. Why would God listen to us? You know, some people think like this. Their theology works a bit like this. I'll try and paraphrase it. Well, you know, let's not be too clever here. Let's not be too audacious. No, God is God and he'll do what he wants. And if God's not decided to do anything in Blackpool, then that's God's will. We've got to be careful here. That's not what I read in my Bible. I read in my Bible that God has made these promises to us. And that what God does is down to his sovereign purpose and power and how many he saves. But we are his people called by his grace. And he tells us now these promises are for us. They're for us. Dare to believe. That's the challenge of 2020. I dare you to believe. I dare you to believe. To really believe. To say, okay, all right, 
if this is true, then what you're saying is that we can have a revival in Blackpool and we can see God move in a mighty way and do the things that he's promised in the Bible. We can do that because God has made those promises to us, you're saying. I do believe that. I do believe that. Why would he listen to us? Why would God answer our prayers and hear our prayers for this? Well, I'll I'll tell you why. He's been telling us tonight. He's been telling us this morning why he would do it. Let me me read it to you. It's, it's, It's beautiful by Top Leary. Listen to this. I'm a debtor to mercy alone. Of covenant mercy I'll sing. Nor fear with your righteousness on my person and offering to bring the terrors of loan of God with me can have nothing to do. My Saviour's obedience and blood hide all transgressions from view. I've got a redeemer. I've got redemption. Can you see? I've got this redemption. Who are we? Do you know who we are tonight? We're the people who are the called of God. Who are we? We're the people who believe this gospel. Who are we? People who have their sins forgiven? No, we're the people who are called by his grace. We are the called of the Lord. We are the redeemed of the Lord. We're a special people. We're not ordinary people. You, friends, and I have extreme privileges with God. You're mine. I bought you. I paid for you. I have redeemed you. Ask. Ask what you will. Jesus taught us to pray that way. My heavenly Father knows what you have need of. You ask him. He will not give you a fish if you ask a scorpion, if you ask for a fish, a stone, if you ask for bread. How much more will your heavenly Father give to you? You are the redeemed of the Lord. You are his Precious ones. You is. You're mine, says God. You're mine. I have redeemed you. I have called you. I have, I have saved you. Now, here's the argument of top lady. Listen. He has it in the, second, in the second hymn. He goes, Inspirer and hearer of prayer, thou shepherd and guardian of thy, my all to thy covenant care. Can you see what he's saying? God inspires prayers like this. And he moves us to pray. Oh, listen to this. The work which his goodness began, the arm of his strength will complete. His promises, yea, and amen, and never was forfeited yet. It's not forfeited yet. Things future, Romans 8, or things that are now, or all things below or above, can sever my soul. Sorry, can make him his purpose for goal or sever my soul from his love. How do I know that God's going to hear my prayers? Listen, my name from the palm of his hand, eternity will not erase. Impressed on his heart it remains in marks of indelible grace. Do you remember how it ends? Those people in heaven, those saints who are now in glory, were glorified, how does he describe them? More happy, They're more happy than us. Of course they are. Pat Burroughs is more happy than us tonight, but not more secure, not more certain, not more guaranteed. Exactly the same. God grants us to see what it means to be the redeemed, to be the called of the Lord, and just to live it out in faith. What God would do for his own people, no man has even begun to plumb the depths of it what he's willing to do. God grants us to see it. We have absolutely no excuse not to trust him and to believe him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this message. Thank you for this great text for this year. Oh, Lord, last year you told us, again, you came to us and said, fear not. You said, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I'll help you. I'll uphold you. We thank you, Lord, you fulfilled that. You did it, and you've always fulfilled your word and done it. But now you come this year and say, oh, believe me when I say I will do a new thing. It will spring forth. 
you will see it. Do you not see it? I'll even make a, a way in this wilderness and rivers in the desert. And, oh, why will I do it? Because I have redeemed you and I've called you by your name and you are mine. And there's only two reasons there, Lord. The whole chapter's jam full. Oh, how great is your covenant promise to us. Forgive us, Lord. Oh, it's easy in one sense to believe if the church is full and packed to the doors, if we're in the midst of revival, if we're seeing thousands of people coming to Christ, Lord, it's easy. But when you, like Isaiah and Jeremiah and all these other prophets in the Old Testament, in days of great dearth, when they could cry, whom, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who has believed our pre preaching, our gospel? Oh, Lord, in those days, then you call us to fear not, but to believe and to trust you. Oh, God, help us to believe. Help us to believe that all these promises are ours in Jesus Christ.